Hello, listeners. This is Ian, and I'm back today with a very special interview with Frost from Satyricon talking about their surprise and surprising sounding new album, Satyricon and Monk. Thank you, Frost, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I say it's a surprise and surprising sounding album because, one, we, we had pretty much no warning this was going to come out. And two, it's not typical Satyricon. I assume... It's already out uh, on digital, so a lot of people have heard it already. So I'm just wondering, how did this come to be? You're no stranger to the world of fine art, whether it's you know, opera or stabbing couches in an art gallery. Uh, can you talk about how you got to, to this really intense and special collaboration with the Oslo Monk Museum? Yes, it's, uh, it's difficult to, <clears throat> to actually find out where to begin because in many ways, you know, a project like this is uh, something that is in the nature of Satyricon to undertake. I think it's it's the result of Satyricon being a very open-minded and creative and innovative band. And we have constantly been seeking new impulses. Um, we have been trying to enter new musical territories with Satyricon. Uh, we have tried to to learn and observe and get better. And I mean, we had a starting point that that basically was that Satir and I had a lot of a lot of spirit and we had high ambitions for Satyricon, but we weren't we weren't gifted musicians. We weren't um, technically very, very competent, and we didn't see it that way ourselves either, but we were very eager to find out where we could go with Satyricon, uh, and we were very dedicated to, to the black metal spirit and to, to music in general, uh, and that has constantly led us to exploring new things and to be unconventional uh, and to dare where other people rather do not want to go in, in fear of being, you know, too untraditional or too unconventional. And, you know, thus becoming the subject of the wrath of their listeners, you know. Uh, so doing something like this, this is kind of in the nature of Satyricon. Uh, but I think that what in particular sparked this project had a little to do with... Uh, what happened in the very late stage of making Deep Calls Upon Deep and the fact that uh, Satir ended up choosing uh, a less known monk work uh, for the cover of the album. Uh, and to tell the story short, it was a friend of his uh, who is also a graphical designer of Satir and has been that, you know, a bit on and off since 95. And he was to digitally release a catalog of monk works, huge catalog. And because he was working with this, Satir got to see it. And this graphic designer thought that it might be interesting to Satir to see lots of these works uh, that perhaps weren't that known. And he also knew that Satir was very much into the works of monk. And as Satir stumbled upon this Kiss of Death work, from the very late 1800s, he felt a very deep connection to it. He, he liked the work a lot, but he also felt that it spoke to him personally and he felt that it somehow related to the music of Deep Calls from Deep a lot. And that led him to, to dive a little deeper into, um, well, uh, that work of art, this case of death, finding out a little more, you know, how it came to be, um, why did it happen the way it happened, um, in which phase of monk was it made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he learned a lot about it. And I think that <clears throat> as he learned more about monk's world and not only his art, but perhaps a bit more of his life as well, I think that took his that took Satir's interest further. And it's basically just my guess that after we were done with 
with the recording and touring with Deep Calls Upon Deep, he felt that he wanted to, to go somewhere else with Satyricon, really somewhere else, not just continue, you know, what we had been doing. Uh, but yeah, undertake some kind of a project, basically as a personal thing for him as a composer more than anything else. But he also felt that Satyr- Satyricon as a band could could benefit from him uh, going into something dramatically different and new. Uh, and since Munk was so much in the forefront of his mind at that point, I think that it made a lot of sense for him to, to think the thought that why shouldn't we do something as bold and daring as trying to uh, make a musical piece uh, that could fit to some selected monk works and make an exhibition out of it. And at the point, he wasn't sure whether this should be, you know, a more personal endeavor on his part or whether it should be a satirical work. But at least he got started with doing this. He, he, he got in touch with people at the museum. Uh, he started, you know, working on all the bureaucracy surrounding such project. And he started making some demos in order to show people at, at the museum and in the organization what he could do. Uh, and it turned out that um, he did actually convince the right people, which meant that the project could start. And from, uh, and from that point, um, it's talk, um, yeah, we talk about more than two years of day and night work on Satir's behalf. Uh, and he didn't know exactly what to, what to create or how to do it, but he trusted his own will and his own determination and his own huge experience as a composer and as a musician that he would find a way and that it would end up being uh, something that was that was really good, something that was right and something uh, that would something that would take him um, where he wanted to be as a composer being like very, very open, creative and, and, you know, working with new impulses uh, and working with something that showed this different aspect of, of being an artist. Uh, and only quite a bit later did it start to dawn upon him and upon, upon me as well that this would indeed be the next Styricon work but then again, even, even as you know, he was well underway with this process, uh, he still didn't know whether the musical piece for the exhibition would be the same music as what would end up on the next Jericon album. He thought that perhaps we could have excerpts from the piece made for the ex- exhibition and make that the foundation of the next Jericon album while the two could end up being something quite different. So it was only um, at the point where the musical piece was made and we had like almost a full hour of, of music that Satir realized that we, we cannot take out something from this piece and start to do something else with it. This will be the album that, that was just clear to him. and. And I drew the same conclusion uh, after hearing it in its totality and in its finished version myself that you cannot tamper with it. Everything is so strongly bound to everything else. uh, And it feels like one long journey and you cannot, you know, interrupt it. You cannot take out certain themes and then make more ordinary songs out of them, for instance. And it kind of feels like a satirical album after all. It does have, you know, that satirical signature. It does have uh, the darkness. And it does have that rather peculiar sound. Uh, it has something very, very Norwegian to it, 
but also something that is yeah very very particular for for satirical i think in terms of tonality and certain rhythmical choices um uh, and some some other elements so so it makes a lot of sense and it turned out brilliant in my book i agree it's really a, a well composed album and I, I think that considering that it's nearly an hour long composition and it, it's it's really composed like you said there's certain rhythmic or melodic figures that are coming back on one instrument or another and if you're not sitting with it for the duration i think that something's getting lost. But before we go too far into the sound aspect, uh, one thing that's frustrated me in trying to learn more about this is there's very little, almost no coverage of the experience of people visiting the museum and what it's like to hear the music and look at the works in situ. So can you can you tell me about uh, the first time you got to listen to it in the space with the paintings? Yeah, definitely. Um... I had heard the finished work before um, before hearing it at the exhibition. I had heard it in its entirety and with finished production once. Uh, but still, it was a bit different hearing it uh, in the exhibition room. One thing is that uh, when you enter that room, you also enter a very particular kind of, of atmosphere. Uh, and that will have uh, some impact on on how you uh, on how you uh, regard the work, and also a particular mix is made of of this album for the exhibition. Oh wait, uh, so there's instance, that, there's a different yeah. mix in the museum than the one that we hear digitally. Yep. Oh, yes, interesting. Yes. Yeah, because uh, in the exhibition room. Uh, there's a huge sound system. This includes, you know, um, uh, sub bass speakers. Most people don't really have that at home, but it's, you know, it's a proper PA system. So that meant that it was possible to, to tune the piece of music to the room. And actually three days were, were spent doing only that and find out, you know, how to how to get the most out of it, and how to perhaps emphasize uh, certain frequencies or certain other elements of the musical work to fit with the room and the possibilities that we had there. Uh, so when I was in the exhibition room and seeing the finished exhibition for the first time. Um, I had pretty much the same experience as I understood that many other have had there, that it felt like the music spoke to the paintings and the artwork, and the artwork communicated with the music. So the, the emotions and the energies and the vibes just came on so very, very strong darkness felt so deep and the melancholy was feeling overwhelming at certain points um, and it was in a way almost a bit too much at times but I mean that in a good sense and, um, and I felt like as, as one who was simply standing there watching uh, paintings and, and, and lithographies and, and other artworks that, that I knew from before, they were coming to life in, in a different way as I experienced them in that room and with that music. And I've heard from many people that they have actually um, simply bursted out crying being there because the feelings came on so strong for them. Uh, but but uh, nobody had been, been saying anything negative about that experience, but, but it seems like it's making a huge impact on people. Um, uh, and that tells us that, um, that uh, Satir did indeed succeed with what he, 
he wanted to achieve with all of this work. He managed to create something that did work well with, with these different monk works. And he did manage to create something uh, that also uh, felt even more emotional, even more dramatic, even more profound, uh, and, and with even more um, value to it as it was experienced and together with these paintings. And, and it takes a lot in order to achieve that, I think. But I, I certainly experienced that myself being there. Did you have a role in deciding which paintings would be, or, or lithographs, or which art would be exhibited in the gallery, or was that more of a collaboration with the museum who maybe had ideas about what they were trying to showcase? No, that was most of all Satir's choice. After all, this was a very personal work for him and, and a personal endeavor and journey. Uh, and he wanted to to choose pictures that he felt somehow um, did fit well together, that somehow could well, either belong to each other or uh, you could feel that, you know, the, uh, the energies or the atmospheres from the one could have, you know, a positive effect on how you would experience the next one or, or another one, at least in the exhibition. Uh, but it, it wasn't so that he could just, you know, pick at will or pick randomly. I think there, that he also had to, to choose pictures that could be made available for his exhibition. And with, with, um, with the works of Monk, it's just so that it's not just so that you could pick and choose anything you would like simply because you want to have it there. You have to, you have to go through all the bureaucracy, and, uh, and the paintings have to be available. And and you know, at certain times, uh, these old paintings and, and artworks they are being restored, and perhaps they cannot be exhibited for a few years because they need to to be treated. They can be very vulnerable. These old ones. So that is, you know, there are so many so many practical things that comes into the, the picture as well. Uh, but I think that he got most of what he, he were, that, that he truly wanted to have. Uh, and he did make a very, very fine and carefully picked selection of, of certain works. He, he, he truly did. And, you know, the fact that you have one of Munch's most famous works there and that it could be made available for this exhibition it was fantastic which is that um, that work uh, simply called angst or yeah uh, anxiety probably monk's second most known picture of all so so yeah there is there's really something i want to talk to you a little bit about the production of the album sonically uh, i i as much as I enjoy it, I, I see this, a lot of folks online talking about, is it metal? Is it satiricon? If it's metal, is it black metal? And I don't really care about those categorizations, but I'm trying to tap into something that, that I think is unstated in some of these observations. And I'm not sure how to put it, but it, it, the satiricon and Monk album almost sounds too good. Even yeah. if you, can, even if you consider, um, you know, I don't. I don't think it's a, a, a an out of left field thing at all, considering Von Graven, the the uh, dark ambient project. Uh, this sounds like it could be that, but there's a lot of. It's very different from that, and I, th if I, I can't find a way to put it delicately, I think that black metal fans are accustomed to bad synthesizer sounds imitating traditional instruments, and that that terrible bad mimetic keyboard sound is just part of what they want and when you do you say get out a real hardinger out or or, or actually have quality recordings of, of acoustic instruments that these keyboards are supposed to emulate something for the fans i th i think there's a friction there am i am i totally off base no <laughs> i guess that um, if satir had been in the room here 
uh, and hearing what what you just said now, uh, I think we would have seen a little smile on his face because <laughs> he would have agreed right away. And I think that um, yeah, that's that's an opinion or a feeling at least that that you share with him as well. Um, and yeah, I, I think that uh, you're very right. Many people in in the world of metal are very used to um, lo-fi recordings and, and at least they aren't perhaps that used to um, the real deal in terms of, for instance, synthesizers or orchestrations. And now that the, when they hear the real deal, yeah, perhaps they feel that, you know, it sounds almost um, too clean, too huge. Uh, uh, it's something that, you know, has left the metal world that they're used to. It becomes something else. And I know that metal people have a bad tendency being a little conservative. That is not true about all people. Far from it, I, I experienced many metal people that are very open-minded and, and are definitely receptive uh, to ideas that aren't strictly belonging to, to, to metal in the traditional sense. And many, many of these people enjoy fine art and they manage to think out of the box. And, uh, and yeah, they are enlightened people. But then you do have a group of people that, cling on to certain standards, some some codes, uh, and they have some weird criteria uh, as for, you know, what can be recognized as black metal or, or, or metal at all. And I must say that many of these uh, appear to me being very, very simple and old-fashioned and counterproductive, but that's how it is. And I think that we have to allow people to, to think that way, but we can at least do our best showing what we think is the correct way of approaching it. And perhaps we could try to, to make people understand uh, by example, uh, how you could do it in a different way than the traditional one, because after all, if everybody were to do everything in a very traditional way, we wouldn't have black metal in the first place. I mean, somebody had to invent something that was uh, so hard and so extreme and so dark and so, so different and so eccentric, and which was going so much further than anything else that we actually got this genre. And in Satyricon, we have always held that pioneering spirit in very high regard. Um, and we try to bring along, you know, we, we try to carry that flame. It's true. I, I like that you make the, the case that you're leading by example here. And that's something that I think that Satyricon has done for a long time, not without controversy. So if I could, if you don't mind addressing one more uh, production or, or metal type controversy, uh, one that you're directly involved with, and is the evolution of the black and roll feel in Satyricon's music. Personally, it, it, it's what really drew me to you, uh, but I know that a lot of people feel that that was a, you know, I don't know, a weakening or, or uh, maybe uh, you know too too far into mainstream vibes for what should fundamentally be extreme. Can you talk about? I mean, what your internal process was as you were starting to incorporate more black and roll style beats? Were, were you? What brought you to that point? Oh, again, you know, several things. Uh, but Stirkon is a lot about evolution, and it's a lot about. Satir and me trying to to learn and get better at the dude. And album by album, we try to see, you know, what new can we bring into Satyricon that we didn't have before? What new resources have we gained? Which insights 
have we gotten better at playing our instruments and, and are there things that we can do now that we couldn't do before? All those things apply, you know, every time we start making a new album, whether we end up with something that is very, very different and perhaps very, very unconventional or whether we come up with something that is perhaps a bit closer to the predecessor. At least we always try to 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 observe and learn and get better. We try to have a lot of creativity and innovation going on. We try to facilitate that. And as a result, uh, we do have, you know, this constant change being one of the few things that you can always be sure of in Satyricon. We are unpredictable, but one thing is is always true and always certain. It is that we are gonna we are gonna do something different, but the satirical signature will always be there on every album. And as we had made our three first albums, um, ending with Nemesis Divina, we felt that we had been doing a lot of epic music. Uh, we had been doing medieval stuff. We had been doing folk-inspired melodies and songs. And we had combined that with, with, with black metal and we had kind of made that the satirical trademark of the time. Uh, and we felt that that was basically as far as we wanted to go with that type of music, having so many um, epic elements and, and base our music so much on, uh, on melodies and medieval themes and and these rather grand and monumental themes, you know. And also the songs that we made on the first albums were pretty much going in one direction. They started somewhere and you would go into, you know, 20 different themes by the time that the song was was over. And that was all fine. And there was something something free and liberating about just writing the kind of music that we wanted to make without paying attention to what would be a typical song structure or any such thing. Uh, but as we got to Rebel Extravaganza, uh, we felt that we wanted to go in a very, very different direction. And, you know, there weren't really much forests or mountains left in 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 our music you didn't truly really feel that there was something that was way more clinical and hostile and and surgical and, and cold and and you know pretty much uh, derived of, of those those more lively feelings of, of nature and at the same time as we as we brought that into it we also started to to bring in some more what I think of as traditional elements. I mean, we started to have a little bit more uh, choruses and verses and, and more traditional structures. And after Rebel Extravaganza, which was, you know, a bonkers album at the time in many ways, um, we thought that the the, the one good path for us was to actually explore something that we hadn't done, which was make, make more traditional songs in, you know, the, in the traditional rock, rock and roll way, actually making, you know, uh, choruses and verses and bridges have pretty, you know, simple structures, but that would have a lot of power and that, that would work well. And we started to realize that uh, we didn't make things easier for ourselves that way. We actually had to learn things that we that we didn't know that well. We had to get better at at structuring the songs, uh, and we realized that this was something that we needed in Satyricon. Perhaps this was something that we weren't that good at, but which the band would benefit from us learning uh, and get good at. So, so, yeah, we started doing that. And also, it has to be said that both Satir and I are very much into uh, early black metal, which is closer to rock and roll. 
like listen to Venom. <laughs> it's it, it's rock and roll and punk, but then with you know turbo and a rabbit vocalist and and some darkness to it and a raw sound. But you know it is pretty much uh, yeah pretty close to 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 rock and roll music and to, and to pop music. And it's the same with, with the early battery works and even old Hellhammer and Celtic Frost really came out of the, of the rock and roll and punk world. Um, and we also enjoy, you know, old hard rock and, and, and rock from the late 60s and early 70s. So, so this is music that we like and music that has meant a lot for, for black metal in its very early stage. Uh, and it made perfect sense to us to kind of return a little to the roots and trying to do things more in the way of how it was done when we started to like this musical genre in the first in the first place. But we thought that we will still make it sound satirical. We aren't interested in copying any bands that we like ourselves, but we certainly want to see if we can make this more timeless songs, which rock and roll songs are, and see if we can can make these structures work. And we find we found that it was very difficult actually to 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 write, you know, whole albums consisting of songs that had traditional structures. Uh, uh, it took things of us as musicians and definitely of Satir as a composer. Uh, that um, that we really didn't have from before, or at least we hadn't showcased it it before. Uh, and we found that these these structures, if you manage to master uh, composing them and performing them, there is actually a lot of power and potential there. And we truly wanted to to explore that and and to see how we could make Tyricon grow as a band, uh, being able to, to write traditional songs as well. And hence, then that is what we did, especially from, from Volcano on, and, and also for a couple of albums more, uh, before we really let loose the reins again. Uh, but then we had learned something. That, that benefited the band a lot because after having gone through that phase, not only had we made some of Satyricon's classic albums, but we did also master something uh, that we would benefit from for you know the rest of our career. But we could eventually use it a bit more freely. But it was important for us to to kind of cultivate structuring songs for several albums because that's what it took in order to, to, to learn it and, and to master it and to dig into it. I think you're really right that the perception that writing in a traditional song structure, verse, chorus, bridge, whatever, the, the perception that that's somehow easier is so wrong because when you work that way, you're working in a musical grammar that's, that most people understand. So any move that you make within that framework is going to be, you know, judged as is going to be judged knowledgeably by people who've heard music in this form before. Whereas if you're just, you know, chaotic, it, it's hard for, for most people, not just to get into it, but to really lay a valid critique upon it. So it's, it's fascinating to me that that's your middle phase where you get critiqued for being too structured, but now at your most current phase, you're being critiqued for being too unstructured. <laughs> uh, I think you I clearly hear the lessons of working in a, a pop rock format, if you just want to call it that, in your now way more abstract work. I, th I think that that trajectory is really clear for people to hear. Yeah, yes, exactly. And um, um, that's how we really want things to be, that when we work with music, we want to, we want to not only make good music, which is the most important, but we also do want to open doors for ourselves so that, you know, uh, we can find new rooms and that we can keep ourselves motivated as well. That's, that's a huge part of it. Uh, can I turn just one last question at you uh, about your fan base and what it's like to have a career with this kind of longevity, with this kind of community? And 
there's a, a live video, a fan shot crowd video of yours that I, I saw and absolutely loved and kept winding back and back. And it's, you're at some sort of outdoor festival. I think the song is uh, Repine Bastard Nation. And it's from the back of this outdoor crowd. And it's just showing the band on the stage. Nice performance, very good. And it pans out across the whole crowd until it gets to the very back. And there's what I what I'm assuming is just a dad with his like three or four year old daughter. And they're just dancing around in, in circles in the back, having like fun daddy daughter time at a Satyricon show. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is probably one of the most, at least from my experience, one of the most accurate representations of a metal show and metal fandom is that, you know, it, it's not it's not all, you know, the big upfront pit screaming action. There's a lot of older folks. There's a lot of multi-generational folks. I'm just, so have you seen this multi-generationality growing in your fan base through, you know, your career? Oh yeah, I, I, I do have, um, um, I think uh, one would have to be blind not to, not to see that we have more varied group of fans today than we did have back in the very old days. Uh, and that's a natural result of us having been around for, you know, some good 30 years now. Uh, and it would almost have been weird if it, if it hadn't happened. And beyond just stating that, you know, this is in many ways what you would need to expect having been around for that long. Um, yeah, I could, I could end with Satyricon is a band that I, I truly think can be appreciated in many ways and on different levels. You have those that really appreciate uh, the darkness, um, the atmospheres, the ambience, the energies, the rawness, uh, the diabolical feeling of, of Satyricon. And there are people that basically come to see our shows because they think it's the best rock and roll energy they experience anywhere. I have heard that being said several times. And then there are people that are simply very open-minded and appreciate how Satyricon uh, could be doing an old school black metal song and making it work in one moment and then do something that is completely different the next and then take another turn again to something unexpected after that and everything feels very right and is done with a typical satirical conviction. Certain people appreciate satirical a lot for that. And, and all these things are possible, either alone or in combinations. And that also means that it is only to expect that you will have very different types of of people uh, seeing and appreciating our shows. And I'm glad to see it. Okay, thanks for, for the talk. Uh, it was good.